Hi, I'm Claire Gregory and my daughter Olivia died six weeks ago from a DIPG brain tumour. She was very funny, wicked sense of humour. She was just a pretty normal little girl really. As a family, we could all see there was she was a poorly little girl, but we couldn't quite understand what it was. There were some mornings where she would wake up with a headache and say that she was sick, find it difficult to walk in a straight line, that she would be falling over nothing, just thin air. It was like something was just draining her, it was bizarre. We went to see a um, consultant paediatrician and he said that it was fine, he said in her eyes and uh, what he could see and the things that she could do, it was fine. But that didn't make sense. I then thought, I'm going to be brave, I'm going to say it, I'm going to say it out loud. I think she's got a brain tumour. In his words were, they're very, very rare. Very, very rare. And I think I said something along the lines of, well, they may be rare, but someone has to get them. And why wouldn't it be my child? We came across the Brain Tumour Charity Head Smart campaign, that the information was there, and it was like tick, 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 tick. I just felt sick. Then you have to take a deep breath, and I thought, this is it. So we need to go to A&E and tell them everything and just make sure we get that MRI. We had the longest walk ever, the longest walk with the consultants. And they said, um, we've done the MRI, we've looked at the scans, and we found there's a mass on her brain. She has a brain tumour, um, it's in her brain stem. It's called a DIPG, which is a diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. It's incurable, and she's terminally ill, and she has, we think, nine to 12 months. <laughs> Halfway through radiotherapy, um, the normal protocol was to wean steroids and Olivia suffered. She, she found it difficult to have them tapered and the lower dose uh, meant that some of her symptoms came back. So she then had to end up in a wheelchair, so she had mobility issues. Yeah, that was hard. That felt like part of her we were losing already. We were starting to see really what this, this, this DIPG, really what it was going to do. You probably do. I think I had, I had days where you feel like you wanted to run away. Just just run away, but you can't. And it didn't make any difference if we went away because she was still going to die. So you have the choice, and you have the choice to live and do as much living as you can. Sit in his nose, Olivia. I was on a DIPG Facebook group with other parents, um, started chatting to somebody and found out that their daughter obviously had DIPG as well and they'd actually donated her brain. And this was like a light bulb moment for me. This was, well, if I can't donate organs to help a child live, we can at least donate her brain for research. And then that will eventually help, hopefully, help other children live. So it, it was sort of the same, but it was it was a light bulb moment because it was suddenly something positive. It, for me, it felt really positive that Olivia wasn't ever gonna grow up really and have a job or do what normal people do. And how was she gonna leave a, a footprint? How was she gonna leave a legacy? But I thought, actually, this is gonna be her job. This can be her job. We were then uh, given the really, really sad news. As textbook as expected at nine months from diagnosis, um, she had gone into what they call progression. In other words, the tumour had started to grow again. And then she just dipped. You could tell there was a change, a shift. Everything was different. Tony said to me, why don't you go to bed for a few hours? We'll do a shift change. We were starting to do it in shifts. And I'd only been in bed an hour. And he came up and said to me, I think you need to come down. She's changed again. You need to come. And then I walked straight in the room, looked at her, and I was like, yeah, this is it. So I straight on the phone to Padative, our, our contacts at Gosh. And then I looked over and she stopped breathing. She stopped. And she just, it was peaceful. And the back of your mind, you're thinking, right, plan, donation. You know, she's got to be chilled. You know, she's got, we've got this is precious, this gift. We've got to look after her. So I remember going in the car and I held her. It was the first time I cuddled her for ages. We hadn't cuddled for so long because she didn't want to be held. It was really quiet and then we got to hospice, there was one lady waiting for us and we went in and then we put her into a, in the bereavement suite and tucked her in bed and, and that was it. And then we just sat and we waited and we knew what was coming. We knew, we knew the plan was in action, there was nothing to worry about and it's what we wanted. And Livia had a job to do and we were going to help her do that job and the, the gift was on its way. On reflection, now we had time to look back. I know it's only been six weeks since she died but it's, it does feel like a comfort. No, it, no, sorry, it is a comfort, not it's like it feels like it. it is a comfort. 
it's given us something to hold on to for this awful situation. Bigger picture, obviously, is research. And I know this is slightly different. You're not given an organ to save a life directly, but indirectly, you will be. If this gift, this donation of Olivia's brain can help even one child, and it can help doctors in, you know, once not to have to sit in that room and give that awful, awful diagnosis to that family, then it's got to be worth it.